Recording is on. Okay. Right. So, hi, Mike. All right. Hello. Oh, okay. So I'll lead it. Um, today is June thirteenth. Well, we're not, not going to do a whole extension <laughs> on that. Are we really it's just, it's just me and you talking? Okay. okay. So okay. today, yeah, we're just going to talk about. Um, I sent you an email about a few days ago, because about it's going to be about three weeks from tomorrow. I started having these. Um, started having, I think, insomnia. I started having only about four to six hours of, of sleep a day, and at the same time, I had these um, muscle like spasms all over my body. And I didn't know what it was. I thought it would go away soon because it was just uh, maybe. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things that happened during that time a few weeks ago. Um, one was the jab, and then another was I drank coffee every day. Another was um, at nights I would leave the light on, and um, I would be reading a book, and then. Like I read um, like Bright Green Lies, Deep Green Resistance. And uh, many times, oftentimes I would just read and then just fall asleep, but the light would turn on. And then I would wake up in the middle of the night to turn off the light. And that happened consistently. And I said, oh man, is all of this contributing to, to my symptoms? Is the coffee causing the spasms? Is uh, the light? actually causing stress and then I mean the work that we're doing is also I mean you know all, all the other members must have felt the same way it's affecting them one way or the other so I was thinking it's probably affecting me inside and it's maybe a few weeks ago it just manifested as uh, insomnia and um, the spasms so after a week, it didn't go away. And then that same week, I had my second jab. So I was really thinking, OK, is the jab, is this the jab? I was just focused on that. And I, at the same time during that week, I stopped drinking coffee. I slept like a normal person, like all lights off, no, um, no stimulation, no light. And I still kept waking up in the middle of the night and um, consistently, and then I think uh, a week and a half ago, that's uh, I tried all I can to fall asleep, and I just couldn't sleep. Maybe I had I slept for an hour, and then I woke up, and then I slept for another hour, and I woke up, and then I couldn't sleep for the rest of the night. And so I thought, oh man, something's wrong with me in my brain or something so I went to the doctor told them every, you know, my whole story they said oh it's just the symptoms of your uh, uh, it's just a vaccine side effect it'll go away and then about mm, you know it happens so give it some time just take some sleeping pills and go to go to bed so I didn't really take any I didn't really, I'm not really inclined to taking sleeping pills. So um, I just took melatonin and it helped me fall asleep, but I still kept waking up in the middle of the night, maybe two or three times. And at the same time, um, the spasms was still there. And then it wasn't until I sent uh, Hugh an email, maybe just this week, um, I explained to him that am I die it felt like I was dying, like like it could have been a progressive neurological disease that it felt so quick that it just okay, at any time I'm I must be gone because this is so unusual. My body's never felt this way ever in my life. And he sent uh, an email saying it possibly could be a Kundalini awakening. And I thought about it, and and he talked about um, Sri Ramakrishna and letting go. 
and keeping that in my reflecting on that, meditating on that. And so, um, yeah, when I sent, when I read that email, I looked up Kundalini Awakening and I noticed a lot of people when they talk about it, and there's a lot of these videos on YouTube, they talk about a similar experience. And um, I couldn't believe it because I thought, are these people crazy? Who like? But even though what they're saying sounds crazy it's like i can relate to them one way or another so i wouldn't just um, ignore them but just see what they have to say and a lot of what they have to say is yeah um there was one person who said about surrendering and, and letting go and um, i think that's one of the things that that got to me so after reading that email and looking at people's um reactions and experiences i try going to sleep and saying okay i'm not going to take any melatonin and so actually this week was is kind of like a, a spike so last um maybe two weeks ago it was the peak and then it looks looks like it's calming down a little bit because um i don't feel the spasms as much and then i still I, when I sleep, I still wake up in the middle of the night, but I can always fall back asleep until maybe 4.30 or 5 a.m. So it's weird. I, I sleep earlier, maybe wake up a couple of times at night and then wake up early and then just start my day. But the difference now and before is before I could just, I slept any time. I had no problem, but now it's, it's, uh, it's something to get used to. Yeah, it's like, uh, if I were to explain it, it's a new, I don't know, um, birth. Like, I feel like it's a, a new person. Um, I took some notes, like, just this last few weeks, I felt like an empty shell. Like things were getting, like, this person is not the same person anymore. And it's hard to navigate that. I mean, it's trying to navigate it during during this time and uh the thing about letting go yeah I wrote letting go of identity material things ideas because i was really hard on prepping and and then it just kind of went away and even letting go of sleep because i really thought that uh, a normal person should sleep eight hours i mean i was just you know just sleeping like a normal person before quote unquote and now i don't know maybe it's a different time you know, maybe i don't know so it's yeah it's it's been an interesting journey so far so have you been meditating have you been doing the exercises yeah so but you know you mean before or now or before before i i would do it but it wasn't like i was i mean when i had time i would do it um the emergency the ripcord technique i would do it many times and i would just yeah so i would do the exercises but it wasn't like um yeah to, speaking of like kundalini awakening i i thought that i wouldn't think it i was already thinking oh no that's not uh i don't think that's going to happen to me because a lot of these experiences it seems like people had like a real they did meditating regularly and they just it seemed like they were set on set and focus on getting the awakening but i just thought oh you know i'll do it I mean, I'll take it seriously when I meditate, but it's not like I wasn't expecting it. So I would do it, but, and I would do it as often as I can, but not like I wasn't expecting a result. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's important that, you know, as if you get to a stage where you've eliminated all the regular medical things, so you know, there's not a regular problem that, you know, that uh, Western doctors can help you with, with ordinary Western medicine. 
Um, and if they get to the stage where they're saying, oh, you know, it's nothing, uh, just have a sleeping pill or something, then uh, I think it's reasonable to start looking at other things like it's Kundalini awakening. So, the, yeah, um, I think if it's the jab or something related to the jab, I don't, I don't think there's anything you could do about it. So you might as well assume that it's right. Kundalini awakening instead of the jab because you know you one of them positive and one of them's negative. <laughs> if you if uh, if you start thinking well it's the jab, but you might go into a self reinforcing spiral. You just yeah. auto suggest yourself. I think a lot of people um, do that. They they start um, bringing themselves down with this kind of circling thoughts, and so I think it's all it's better to assume that it's a kundalini awakening and then you know it's um, it's more positive experience anyway so so what a kundalini awakening is 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 well first off there are a lot of people that are teaching meditation and uh and these kind of exercises that i showed you and, um they're teaching them online and uh, there's a huge industry like a two billion dollar new age industry with all these things you know you know Bookshelf, bookshelves of these books are just you know, groaning with the weight of these things that people write. And uh, most of them don't know what they're doing. So we incorporated all these yogic techniques, and particularly Raja Yoga, which is real yoga, into the West and said, well, they're relaxation techniques. They're not, nothing to do with relaxation techniques. It, you have to relax to, to be able to do them but it's a complete perversion of them. So this relaxation and mindfulness industry is a complete hoax. It was kind of invented in the 1920s. But the real yoga is supposed to do the opposite of put you to sleep, and it's supposed to really wake you up. That awakening is often felt as kundalini awakening, and kundalini means coiled. So the, the idea was that there was this coiled snake like three coils in your sacrum bone. Um, it comes from the Bhagavad Gita, in fact. And what they said was, you know, there's some energy in your spine called Shakti. And then it's, uh, if you, if you, in most people, it's dormant. The, the only time they feel Shakti energy is sexually. So, so what they uh, said in the Gita is that if you, you turn that sexual energy around, it's, uh, you know, the regenerative uh, energy, where they kind of thought that to procreate, you have, you know, kind of this consciousness in your head that's kind of energy or shakti. It goes down this sushumna tube down the back of your spine, which is, is a legit nerve. Um, and it goes to your sacrum bone where they have all the sciatic nerves. It's a big concentration of sci sciatic nerves. That is closely related to, you know, testes and anus and things like that. They're basically uh, reptilian brain things. So basically from your lim limbic system, your limbic system sends signals to your genitals and then your genitals send signals back. It's the same as like smell. Everybody thinks smell is, you know, you have sense sensors in your uh, aromatic sensors in your nasal passage. And when you sniff, then it sends signals to your brain so, so you can smell. It's not really quite like that. What really happens is there's about four million sensors uh, in, your, in your nasal passage that can actually smell. And they send this mass of information up to your brain. What your brain does is it says, enhance that, but it's that particular smell. And so when they look at the message flow in your brain, it's actually the more when you're smelling something, the more signals going from your brain to back to your nose, from your nose to your brain, which just seems strange because you think, you know, it's a sensor, it's picking up information, sending it to your brain. No, your brain is sending most of the information to tell your nose what to do. Now, this is the same kind of thing. Your brain tells basically your genitals, it says either one can trigger. You, you, you know, somebody could grab you by the nuts and it would trigger your amygdala. But equally, your amygdala can can uh, basically tri trigger your genitals or something, so you get an erection or something like that. Now, they that loop system is 
what they call Shakti, the energy going up and down that your, your spine is what they call Shakti. So the way they saw it was, I think this must be an Aryan thing because the ancient Egyptians saw it this way too, that if, if you can transmute that sexual energy into energy of realization, and the ultimate thing is if that energy can go all the way back up your spine, back to your head, if it gets to what they call the crown chakra at the top of your head, it basically completely blows your mind. You'll go into Maha Samadhi. Some, some people, are, there are lots of stories in India about people that, that basically achieve that, um, go into Samadhi, which is a pure state of bliss. It's kind of like a permanent orgasm. And they don't eat, they don't, you know, they're just catatonic and they, they die, you know, basically from starvation. But um, the idea is, yeah, you have an orgasm by reversing the energy back into your head and so that's the, that was kind of uh, that kind of liberated you from the the regular milieu of everybody who just dissipates all the sexual energy just running around doing doing crazy shit from running on a treadmill to you know working in the office to you know porn to sexual energy all sorts of outlets for sexual energy and um, if you if you really want to know how bad it can get you read Kellogg uh, Kellogg, who, the guy who invented the cereals, and he, he was all about, you know, abstinence and all the things to do, um, you know, st to stop masturbation, stop sexual energy and stuff, and they, they kind of thought of it as kind of a leaking thing, which was kind of close to the Egyptian and to the Hindu kind of philosophy. So, so yeah, so if, if you start now doing these practices, what normally happens is, you get some idiot on, on the internet who doesn't know what's happening and they'll teach a small group of people. They'll have like 20 people. Then, so, you know, they'll teach them relaxation techniques um, and call it yoga. Now, it's one or two people at some stage, uh, maybe one in a hundred, is actually going to get a kundalini awakening. And they, they start describing all these weird symptoms. Um, just like you said, they can't sleep. They get us like you know, energy going up their spine, they can get an erection, they can, a whole lot of things which then immediately freaks out the fake practitioner who doesn't know that's actually what is supposed to happen. So they say, oh, this isn't right, because, you know, when they were taught their new age relaxation techniques, and no one mentioned all this stuff. Um, but it, what it is, is really the path which in Hindu or maybe Aryan uh, philosophy was the practice of awakening. So if you can, if you can actually redirect and, and transmutate the sexual energy back into your brain, it's really kind of like an epileptic fit. And epilepsy was always called the divine disease, and it was always known from since ancient times as as having a, a sort of religious aura about it. It's still called an aura, you know. But, um, uh, people just before they have have. Um, have a, a fit, a grand mal seizure, um, an epileptic fit, they they often uh, will have an aura, which it's called an aura. So if you talk to people that, that have epileptic fits, they, they'll tell you they know exactly the point that they're going to have them. They could know all the symptoms, they can feel it. They, they, I think, often get a like metallic taste in their mouth. But all of these things are symptoms that their brain is going to have a big overload. And that's, um, now this is the thing. A lot of them won't take any meds for it because they like it. They basically, it is a mind expanding experience. It's just like taking drugs. And so uh, the, um, even though grand mal seizures tend to get worse over time, they still don't start, take their meds. They still don't some, cause, cause, cause it's like a religious experience, a wonderful experience where everything kind of makes sense often. Um, and uh, so it is an experience of enlightenment. Um, so, yeah, so then for, I think all of this is legit. It's not really well known in the, in the West, in, in Western science. So you can't go to a doctor and sort of say all this because they think you're not. Uh, but it, in terms of um, Ayurvedic medicine and, and so it, I, I mentioned Sri Ramakrishna and stuff because they, they're all very explicit on this this kind of thing and um and sri ramakrishna is good the the gospel of sri ramakrishna is well worth reading 
Um, and so Sri Ramakrishna had a disciple called Vivekananda. Vivekananda was the first person to come to the West. Um, he came to the, the um, what, what was it, the Council of Religions? It was, it was this huge thing at, in Chicago at the fair, the World Fair. And they, part of it was the religions of the world. And um, Vivekananda came from India and introduced Americans to Hinduism for the first time. Um, and told them about Sri Ramakrishna, and, um, and so that, that was in 1901, I think. Um, so uh, that started the whole movement, the Sri Ramakrishna Vivekananda movement, and and all the esoteric things, all the way down to the Maharishi and the Beatles, it all came from Vivekananda. So Vivekananda explains all of this in, um, in a book that he wrote. Uh, and yeah, that's the basis of of the Hindu form of awakening, which I think is also the Egyptian form. And it goes, I think it goes back to Hermes Trimagistus and uh, it, it, it comes up again in all these esoteric cults. Um, so it stays in an underground Western tradition, um, Hermetic Western tradition. Um, that's uh, so some of the, the monastics um, and the esoteric monastic uh, groups, they, they would also do this meditation, also discover these types of things. And so that is my brief version of what, what Kundalini is. It's a, in essence, it's transmutation of sexual energy in, into realizational energy. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it saves you going out and getting LST. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there were some other symptoms, like um, I think the day that it was severe, I had uh, lower back pain, upper back, or it was just, and I thought this is unusual, but it went away maybe a few hours or at most a night. And the day when it was most severe, I felt, I panicked because it went here, I tried to sleep and I was listening to some meditation music because I thought, okay, maybe... I just need to meditate, but I felt like it made that energy uh, rise up even more. <laughs> and I noticed that recently that when I meditate, I think a few days ago, it was, I felt some body sensations that I wouldn't. Um, and, and I read or saw people say that when you meditate, that energy um, actually amplifies. Um, can you talk about that? Why it amplifies with the kundalini yeah, it, awakening? It, uh, so, so it, again, it's it's like people talking themselves into a psychosomatic illness, but this is a virtuous cycle. So, so the more you actually meditate, the more uh, the more you awaken kundalini, the more you can concentrate on it, and uh, it goes both ways. So, you can get into a situation where people desire it. As soon as you desire it and you try and make it happen, it disappears on you. <laughs> but if you really let go, so if you come from a point of view where you don't desire it or you didn't know about it, then it, immediately it enhances it because the more you notice it, the more attention you give it, the more it, it arises itself because it is this feedback loop. Um, so the I think it is... Uh, it, you do want to encourage it. it. Basically, it is part of progress and part of enlightenment. So you, um, yeah. So, the, so paying attention to it increases the energy. You you get to a stage. Uh, you, by the way, you can also do it with other people. If other people are doing the same kind of things in a group, that also reinforces it. Everybody can <laughs> start getting it, the things by proxy. So um, it's. It's powerful stuff. You can, uh, so part of the thing is hypersensitivity. So I'll sort of tell you some of the things that you might might experience, but don't try to experience them. Just just notice that if you do experience them, then this is my explanation for them. But you, you will um, get hypersensitive, especially to things, it's possible to get hypersensitive to music. So you can't listen to like a beautiful piece of music. You, you just, just agony. It's just like physical torture, just tears streaming down your face. And it's it's just so beautiful. You just just 
can't it can't do it. It's it's like you know the agony of uh, of pleasure just listening to music. So you, that you get that kind of thing. You also get a, a sense. Uh, you can also get a sense of a of a pendulum inside you that that kind of directs you. So that's one of the things is they um, they talk about various religious tra traditions talking about the paraclete. And the paraclete is this kind of Jiminy Cricket inside you, this inner guide. Now, most people think, oh, that's your conscience and, you know, just a little voice in your head. But it's, it's much more than that. It's like a hot ball in your, in your chest often. And it directs you so that if you get hypersensitive enough, it will, uh, you can kind of do no wrong because the, the thing will, will tell you it so much i mean if you if you obey it and get used to obeying it you keep it still but if if it goes like left or right it can be so powerful after a while after you've or when you've listened to it it can be a very powerful director and that that director then um can can even you know feel like a pain in in your chest if, but what it is is it's kind of like when there's a decision point or something like that or something you're doing that's not right and it'll know that it's not right. It, it, it becomes so that you actually meet people, and if they false people or liars or con artists or something, yeah, it'll tell you straight away. You'll feel feel you'll feel people are genuine and, and stuff like that. So all of these things come out on the side. They they are kind of side effects. But Gary asked about cities, and some of these things are also cities. Cities are really magic. It's kind of um, magical things are going to happen, and so, yeah. If if you start feeling any kind of cities, or it goes in that direction, then I'll talk about that. But uh, it's not good to talk about cities, especially in in the Western context with the Western audience, because it's we hyper rational, and we don't believe in all of that stuff in in, in our culture. So it just turns people off. They they trained to be turned off by it. Um, and, and the mere fact that they avoid it and are turned off by it means that they can't experience cities. If you are open to experiencing cities, you will, <laughs> you will experience it. So, yeah, I just wanted to sketch that out as a few, few warnings. But, yeah, I, I don't, I, if anybody's thinking, well, this is, is not a good thing, you know, maybe I'm playing doctor or something, and you should be, yeah, I, sh I should be telling Mike to go to get some conventional medicine in the hospital and stuff. Well, it's a lot of things in medicine are psychosomatic. And so you, you're not, even if I was completely telling you bullshit now, it's not really completely wrong because it's it's correct in the, in the point of view of auto-suggestion. So it might, you know, all of these things might not be really testable, say, in Western um, medicine and stuff. But from the subjective experience, yeah, it's, it's completely legitimate, and this is the kind of thing you feel. So, and, and it's more than that. It's the way that you make progress. So everybody from Jung and stuff like that, they, they also delved into this. Um, it, if, you, if you see the major thing about having somebody like me tell you all this, is so that it doesn't make it all negative. A lot of people think, oh, they're going mad or something like that. Have, they get into panic and they have massive uh, concessions of it. But it's the exact opposite. You should kind of celebrate it and, and feel like, yeah, <laughs> this is great. I'm making progress. Uh, and so, so, yeah, and as soon as you feel that it is a, has a positive connotation, it gets better straight away. <laughs> so it becomes that anyway. Um, so, yeah. So is any of this any useful to you? you yeah, yeah, definitely. There was some things I couldn't explain. Like um, I was very, when I had insomnia and when I went out in public, I felt, I and I wasn't like this before. I'm very sensitive to people and, things and i don't know if it was because oh um it's the anti civ notions or like oh no is it what's going on like i've never felt the need to get angry in public i mean i i'd be with family and they'd see it but i would i would just yeah i would just kind of pop out or 
just show myself and yeah just recently just being very sensitive to things around me uh and music yeah i'd either be um inspired very blissful or terrified by certain music so i think that's yeah well unfortunately um if you go and to a psychologist or they were they would quickly diagnose you in a state like this as as bipolar but i think bipolar is is the most the worst weasel diagnosis that western medicine ever came up with and and western psychologists and psychiatrists are complete quacks there's no other word for it it's just pseudoscience it's bullshit um but they and it's a cult basically if you if you see any psychotherapists or something they they behave like a cult they they have you know initiates and kind of overlords and they they report to just to keep your license as a psychotherapist you have to have um um what amounts to to a, a what i can't remember what they call it but basically a senior guide so the che you have to have checkups with them all the time and you know give them money and it's um it's a complete scam, but that's, you know, any li licensing from the official state licensing, you have to do this cult. So, um, yeah, I, they, they complete charlatans and completely useless. And one of the things they, they have no concept of self transformation. Some of the, the union ones are a bit better, but even they don't understand Jung. And then, um, so they, they not any help. And so they generally will do, you know, just basically, say anybody in this condition is has a pathology which is the first thing that's wrong um it's um something to be feared and must be corrected they they must be fixed in other words which is the next bit of bullshit <laughs> and and then third they don't know that there's such a thing as personal transformation in anything other than very superficial um kind of college undergraduate kind of way um, but but a, a complete uh, breakdown and use psychosis and transformation into um, another person alarms the hell out of them. And it's they, that's really what they're trying to avoid in their patients. They're trying to avoid a breakdown where what they should be doing is pushing themselves in that direction. What that leaves us is with a very difficult position because you don't have space in our culture to go through a transformation because it's, it's so stigmatized that you know, if if any of this, you know, basically comes out, you know, they'll hospitalize you, you run the risk of running up huge medical bills and be get a label and you can ruin your whole life. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, but, so there needs to be some kind of forum or safe space where you can go through this transformation without people pathologizing it. And thinking and thinking of it as positive. The problem is the very few places <laughs> that even have a clue uh, about about it, let alone think of it in a positive light. But yeah, Sri Ramakrishna um, is, is is well worth studying because he's amazing. I really I really would have loved to have lived at his time because and, and in India because in India they're so forgiving that he could do anything. He lived for a year up a tree naked with all, you know, in his, what's called his Hanuman face. He thought he was the god Hanuman. And he he lived literally with these monkeys up a, in a, in a um, not a baobab tree, um, a mangrove tree and outside the Dakshineswar temple, the Kali temple. So can you imagine if you, you know, were naked and went jumping through the trees and lived for a year like that with monkeys, eating all their food and just doing monkey shit? Um, you know, they would lock you away. You, you wouldn't last a day doing that in our culture. Yeah. The police would put cuffs on and lock you away. So, but he had all, he had years and years and years to experiment with all of these things. You know, he did, you know, he got dressed, he cross-dressed, he did anything just for psychological experiments and so that latitude of freedom I, I really you know kind of envy him in that time and place because even now in india today you can't really get away with that they no longer think it's sacred so yeah so any abnormal behavior that makes you unproductive we're, 
our narrative is one of production. We are basically a slave culture and everybody has to be a productive slave. So if you're not a productive slave, you're broken. And so then they, into this narrative of fixing you. Well, the idea of actually going through a breakdown and transformation out of the slave mindset is just too much for them to even contemplate. <laughs> it's, just so, it's just so heretical that they can barely even think about it with their head exploding, without their heads exploding. So, so yeah, so that it leaves us in a difficult spot where you have to kind of make progress, spiritual progress in this way, knowing that it's subversive in a way. And if you get caught doing it, <laughs> you're part of the underground. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. felt like I, I meant stuck in a, yeah, it's a tough situation, especially on, we spoke about the householder because we have these responsibilities. And the last few weeks, I just didn't want, or something in me just wanted to stop everything and just, do exploration, like when you mentioned Sri Ramakrishna climbing up a tree, I, I had the thought of, oh, I just wanna go out to nature and just explore myself there or something. And I know, oh, but I still have to live here. <laughs> and um, yeah, I just wanted to do more exploration, but it's hard to know what to do and, you know, dealing with legalities and yeah. And the other thing was, um, yeah, just, um, just yeah, navigating through this. <laughs> so you have to get the mindset in our culture. You have to get the mindset of of being a thief or a crook. So you have to get the a idea that you're a villain that have, hasn't committed any crime. So so all of these altered states of mind are criminal um, in in our culture. So if you take LSD, all these all these drugs like LSD is completely harmless, but it, it's, it will keep its class A category and you'll be sentenced to jail uh, for associating with it because it's, it's very, very um, subversive to our culture and particularly you know, sending the youth off the, the rails so they, they no longer believe in the culturation program, they no longer believe in our slave culture. So, so although most people come to the to this radical mindset through things like drugs. And then they can pin the, the abuse on the drugs. They can always say the cause of this deviant behavior is the drugs. Then, then they can criminalize the drug behavior. But you see, if you come at it where it's self-induced, if you do it from practices, <laughs> you, you basically go this route. There's nothing they can pin it on. They can just say, well, you've gone mad or you, you know, you're insane and so you have to lock up. But, but now, now comes the part where you're a criminal that's not done a crime because they can lock you up for no reason at all um, just, just by exploring these other states of mind. Um, if they don't have the drug excuse, then they've, they can use a psychiatric excuse. And there's no test for a psychiatric illness, so that any any doctor can just use their power to to basically section you if they they chose to. So what the the criteria they use to make a determination like that is is are you a threat to society and are you a threat to yourself? So is knowing that it's quite easy to navigate. So the idea is is in this mindset, it's a rebellious mindset. And the idea is that you make progress in place, just like you're in a gulag and you're planning an escape, but no one can see you making this escape. You, you're really tunneling out of the gulag psychologically. But if anybody catches you tunneling out, you'll be <laughs> in deep trouble. So the idea is basically to become uh, a, a kind of a, a secret agent where you carry on practicing, doing all these things, go out in nature, try and do the things that Sri Ramakrishna did, but you make damn sure you have an excuse. So that if anybody comes in and says, oh, that's really deviant behavior, Mike, or like there's something wrong, you better have a damn good excuse of, of why you're doing it. So you need to have a cover story all the time as you make progress. But, but once you think in that way, there's lots of leeway, and certainly one of the reasons why I would like to get an ARG going is an ARG covers all sins, right? Because 
you you can go and get up a tree and do do the weirdest shit man to man with monkeys and you can just claim it's part of the arg which is a which is a good excuse for in our western culture because the arg and alternate reality game is just just about acceptable so it covers a whole lot of sins so so it would be really nice if the the arg was a thing and then you can you can always but but i would recommend that you use the arg you do use it as an excuse and so you can pin anything on it and and in fact you can pin anything on me too you you can always say you met this guy called Hugh online and he's told you to do some weird ass shit like <laughs> go out in nature and try all these things so go go and do anything you want and just pin it on me because because that that too then you know uh you know i mean there's not a, a lot they can do to, okay, so I, I would be filling the role of a shaman, but really in their view, it would be the role of a cult leader. There's not a lot they can do to a cult, cult leader because you know, we have this idea, thanks to the founding fathers of uh, you know liberty and individual free action. So the idea that you know an adult has choice um, is kind of you know sacrosanct in law. It all goes to pieces uh, as soon as a psychiatrist steps in, because then, but then they say there's damage to society or there's self harm. But but if you if you say, well, desiderata number eight specifically forbids self harm, and you make sure that you don't do any destructive behavior to to society on a regular basis. You can always change that later when we start doing, well, you know, work on the, for the world. Um, there's a good, good deal of scope for monkey wrenching and stuff like that. But ecotage, but but yeah, I mean, ecotage is not really part of spiritual development. That really is a separate line of work to correct the sins of the alien cortex in the in the world. Uh, so that that is not quite the same as being a psychonaut and doing self-discovery. So you have to get used to doing weird things and anything that takes your fancy. Um, and yeah, de develop the idea that you're you're kind of a secret agent. And so you always have an alibi. You always have an excuse. And you, you, the only thing is you have to think up something beforehand and set things up so that nobody can actually uh, Nobody can actually, you know, prosecute you. Or, or uh, now, that that that's prosecution is really from authorities and stuff. But what what uh, what's more difficult is the people around you. So the people around you and family and loved ones, they get uh, very upset. And the major reason is they feel that they're losing their mic. <laughs> they don't want people to be transformed or uh, develop. They, they want people to stay in their box, the box that they put them in. So it challenges their world, it challenges their security. Um, and so th they want everything to be static. And, uh, you know, basically, so they, they will try and prevent that change in you. So you have to handle that. And the best way to do it is to handle it lovingly, just knowing that they don't have the knowledge, they don't know why they're doing that, and just, you know, be, be understanding of it. Um, so yeah, how's that? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, because the last few weeks have just been, yeah, the the idea of being a secret agent, and you talked about this before, but now it's making a lot more sense from a perspective of um, Kundalini or spiritual awakening. It's yeah, because once you get through a certain point, you just oh no now what do i do and there's so much you know we know the limitations of civilization and the laws and just thinking differently yeah that's that helps and yeah I, i'd say that anytime i do something different um it feels better i mean something the energy is accepting of it or people talk about their energy either telling them no don't do this or this isn't a good idea or rest or and then I, people talk about oh yeah this is good keep keep at it keep at it so 
Yeah. <laughs> um, there's this kind of policeman. Uh, okay. How do I approach this subject? Um, okay, so if you think in terms of a shaman, so if, if I was a shaman taking on a shamanic journey into a cave, and it's basically the journey into the afterlife. So it's it's the deep journey you would be taken into this cave since ancient times, and it, it you would be told that it's it's a, it is your death. So you're being prepped for death, but you will be taken through, and uh, you know it's an early death. Where at some point, the early on they will introduce all these archetypes to you. They're all kind of demons and things like that that exist in our psychology. And they all come up in various guises all throughout history. But you eventually get to recognize them. Now, there is this figure who's a kind of universal policeman. And that universal policeman will manifest. So it, it can manifest as a real policeman. <laughs> it can manifest as uh, somebody that just says, no, stop, this is this is going too far. So, yeah, um, and it can be yourself. You you can say, no, I, I, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. So, and then you, you stop an experience, you halt an experience that was just getting somewhere because you kind of figure out. But generally, it's some form, it comes in some form of entity that panics and, and clamps down and stops stops what the progress or stops the happening so so just when you about to have a really really interesting experience or breakthrough this cop figure calls a stop to it <laughs> it's it's always some authority figure that, that steps in to intervene um that cop figure really comes from inside you it uh, though it manifests as somebody outside it really comes from inside you so the way to do it is to just you you can't fight it you 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 just accept it um, just you know extric extricate you yourself from the cop and then start again. But that that cop figure is um, is is always somebody uh, yeah it it took okay I better share something with you. so. At, at one stage in uh, in my cult, when when I was about twenty two or something, in that case, um, I had amazing experiences in this uh, schoolhouse. It was basically like Downton Abbey. The whole thing, the whole cult I was in, was exactly like Downton Abbey. Quite a few of these um, houses in England, um, these manor houses, and the whole. So, I had many. Uh, weird and interesting experiences. But one of them was they, there was this festival that they'd have in summer, which um, it still runs today. And it was, all, it was called, um, ah, hell, I'll tell you, it's called Art in Action. But it, um, uh, so as I was part of the, what they call the youth group, and I was, um, and, and we, our job was to set everything up. This huge thing, it was like a huge garden, garden fate. It's a, it's a big deal. It still is, I think. Um, but it's um, we had to set things up and pack them away. Now, we didn't just do this as kind of laborers. We did this as spiritual development, and it was all done consciously. So we would stop beforehand, um, you know, have a goal. So you didn't just stack chairs or something. You would have a goal to actually feel you know, your hands on the chair, to be actually conscious of moving a chair, anything to do with painting or whatever you did, you'd, you'd hone your attention on the working surfaces. So if you're scraping something, you try and keep your attention exactly on that edge and just go, and it's basically that, those kind of exercises are very, very powerful. Now, what happens is you build up the Shakti or Kundalini and weird shit starts happening. So there was this, This I'm, I'm trying to tell you how this, the cop kind of interview. So there was one evening where we were packing up, uh, it was a big tent, a big marquee in the garden, you know, kind of like wedding tent kind of thing. And we were packing, packing up tables. And 
um, the energy you get is very high. Um, and so I just have this memory of this amazing thing. There are about 10 of us that were tasked with this thing, all on the same thing. And we got onto this kind of wavelength together that was, it was absolutely unreal. There was a kind of pink glow. It was, you know, kind of evening. Um, and there was this kind of pink light, just this weird kind of aura, um, a beautiful summer evening. Um, and then, um, so, uh, Hello. Oh, hi, <laughs> hi Gary. Uh, we, I was just talking to Mike, uh, uh, about a question. Yeah. So we, we're recording the, the video, but anyway, I'll, I'll finish my story. I'm we're... sorry. I'll, that's all right. I'll, I'll leave you. It's okay. Yeah. No, you don't have to go. Right. Yeah, but, yeah, just, uh, just to explain what's going on. So, okay. So, so anyway, there's this magical light, this this weird um, aura, and all of us knew that something was going on. Something was, you know, something really, really special was happening. So, um, we were passing these these huge doors and tables. You know, basically, the, normally it would take like two or three people to lift them. We, we were passing them to each other just in the air. They were kind of floating. And we were just handing them off one just to another. And we were all kind of speechless, thinking like, just, just in awe, thinking, oh, my God, like, what the fuck? And all being so, we didn't want the spell to end. And it was getting bigger and bigger. And we were moving the things faster and faster. And it was just, it was just so incredible. It was like having... It was, the, the doors and stuff, they, were, they felt like nothing. And it felt like we were just passing them in the air, just throwing them to each other. And, and we all knew what was happening. No one dared speak. It was just this beautiful feeling. Then suddenly, they always had a guy, you know, a more senior guy in charge. Um, and so he, he came in. It was just when this thing was going quite mad. He came in. Right at that point, <laughs> I just remember he just looks with this look of horror on his face, <laughs> and he it like shattered his whole world. And he just stood there, and he he just kind of exploded. And he said, "Stop!" He said, "Stop! All of you, stop!" He said, "What the fuck is going on?" And basically, everybody was like, "Oh man, you just ruined it! <laughs> you just ruined it!" And and so many many times after that. Just when things were really, you were going to have an experience that was really out of this world, this damn cop figure leaps in and stops it. And man, I used to resent that. I, I, I tried everything. Like, how do you stop the cop walking? <laughs> it's about to get super interesting. This bloody cop walks in. Some form, some authority figure. And so, and so eventually, I, I learned uh, that that uh, to kind of sweet talk that cop, you need to kind of negotiate around that, that cop. They will appear. You can't stop them appearing. But the thing is to kind of, you know, get around them, shuffle them out of the room, and then, then, then the really amazing stuff happens. <laughs> but it's, it's not easy to get to that because of that, that damn cop thing. But I just wanted to mention that. So tell me if you ever meet that cop. The cop thing is yeah. kind of like, like uh, with with LSD and stuff, they talk about the machine elves, and the the machine elves are often people. I think that come up to people and they try and uh, they're friendly, but they try and lead people or coax them and stuff. And they, that the machine elves trope has quite a lot of aspects of the cop thing. But there's something in our uh, it's in our alien cortex, and it 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 can smell that this stuff is not right. And it shuts it down very quickly. So I just wanted to mention that. So tell me if you ever meet that cop. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I haven't met it pers like uh, manifested, but I do sense a, like um, an aura of it. And yeah, I think it's coming from the alien cortex. I mean, even as a for normal people when they're not doing some anything like sexual acts. Um, something in their brain stops them from having an orgasm or stops them from accomplishing or doing something that would 
if they naturally just let it, you know, really um, let go and release, then they would have it naturally. So. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. Exactly. So. So. Um, yeah. It, it's more than just inside ourselves. So, I think. Um, yeah. Okay. I've got to get a bit woo woo and mystic here, but but our, our brains are really they. I, I kind of like the Penrose kind of thing with uh, something to do with consciousness or some quantum um, quantum aspects, and it's to do with microtubules probably in your brain. So it's not very well understood. But the reason why I kind of like the quantum thing is because there seems to be some kind of non-locality in people's brains. So if some there, there are too many stories, you know, the subjective story of intersubjectivity, where where somebody has a thought, somebody else. Um, you know, has a kind of telepathic response to it. So I think what happens is, is you you're on the you're just about to get somewhere in terms of an experience, and what happens is uh, then that you the mere fact that you're going into kind of forbidden territory, you're really going off the reservation. Somebody detects that in some kind of quantum superposition or non-locality. And they, they, something draws them into the room to, to put a stop to it. So, so it can often be somebody else that's triggered. Something or other they know that's going on. Yeah. Um, and it goes all the way back to like little kids and stuff. It's like, you know, little kids uh, playing doctor or something like that. Their, their mother says like, oh, it's too quiet in there. I know something's going on and immediately bursts into the room. That's the, the cop effect that later can can be in all sorts of things where where, where something is is not kind of forbidden by our culture. And the reason why it's forbidden by our culture is because it's going to destroy the alien cortex. So it's it's going to destroy the ego. Um, and so that's that's why we have that book in there. But yeah, I'm, I'm just warning you of that since we, we talked about being subversive and a secret agent yeah it's pretty about all this because there used to be you know this used to be standard stuff for all the way back to shaman maybe 50,000 years or more ago so it's kind of a sad that we, we got to the stage where the, there were eventually four paths there were three paths you know the yogi the faker the the, the warrior and then they added a fourth one which is the way of the householder when people got domesticated and they said basically you can, you can, you know, but yeah, you can have a normal life, have kids and a family, but then you do this kind of underground work in in place. So you like a secret agent. The fourth way is is like being um, a, a secret agent in in enemy territory. Um, so so you carry on behaving like you know a mole or a, a, an agent in a sleeper cell. You, you carry on developing um, all of these spiritual practices in, in secret and subversively. Yeah. yeah and that uh, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, especially when you talked about the secret agent, that this type of work is subversive because, um, yeah, for the, the last few weeks, I just thought, man, no, no one's going to accept this in society this is not something that i can just so yeah yeah or else i'll be seen as a crazy person i'll be pathologized uh so, yeah yeah i already that that was rolling in my head that was just that was really causing well, a lot of anxiety in me too <laughs> yeah the anxiety is justified because there are risks but you know it's it, it would be nice to be richer because Rich people can get away with being much crazier than your average slave, your average debt slave. But you know, Jung, Jung used to do crazy shit from all the time, but he he had the protection of having a, a great reputation and being you know being a, a a relatively famous person. So so if you if you're famous, you can do all sorts of mad shit, and people just say you're eccentric. If you do the same thing when you're not famous, then you, yeah, they can lock you up in a heartbeat. 
because um, but Jung, you, for example, but Jung is well worth looking at, and Sri Ramakrishna as well, because you can see how I think of doing the crazy shit that Sri Ramakrishna did, and get away with it. There, there are lots of things that you can get away with. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, Sri Ramakrishna got you know did a lot of cross dressing and explored female sexuality and male sexuality and all and and that's permissible now you're allowed to do that you get you, in the 1950s that would have got you locked up but now suddenly that's acceptable um the Jung would spend a lot of time just mucking about um with water and mud and you're essentially playing in the mud like a kid um and you know at his home in um uh, Bollinger or whatever it's called in, in Switzerland, uh, Bollingen. But um, he, yeah, all the the locals thought he was a complete nutcase, and everybody would say, "Well, that's Doctor Jung. He's a famous guy," and they'd be like, "He's a fucking basket case. Just look at him playing in the mud all day." And uh, but and then, but you see, he had complete protection that way. But you you can. You can find protection in all sorts of things. You can say you're an artist, or you can say that you, you know, just doing an arg. Or but it it takes a little more thought. You can't just wade into it like Sri Ramakrishna just did whatever the hell he wanted, <laughs> and there were no consequences apparently in India those times. But there is a lot of permissiveness for being, um, you know, for divine madness. It still is. A lot of that, you, you, but you, you have to, you know, get a reputation for being an eccentric. It's very good to have a reputation for being eccentric because you can get away with all sorts of shit. <laughs> but yeah, but you can't do it in a day. You, you, it's, to get the reputation of a divine eccentric is is something else. But there again, it feeds on itself. You see, you see, the more Jung did, and the more famous he got the more he could dive into more crazy shit and get away with it. And the same applies. If, if you can get a reputation for being a little bit eccentric, but everybody thinks you're the genius and, you know, mad genius and asks your advice and, you know, like spending time with you and thinks you're a great guy, yeah, then you can in, extend that. You can use that as a license. But I think the way to think of it is, is like a budget, is that you, you have a kind of crazy budget and you have to you have to balance it. You have to spend into our culture. You know, you have to have a credit with our culture that you're an okay guy, and then then you have <laughs> some credit where you can spend on being a crazy ass. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, being a science of a crazy ass is well worthwhile. It's it's really being a psychonaut and and trying out things. And there there, there are loads of different cultures. You can in California. Okay, not so much where you are. It is the land of fruits and nuts where you are, but you go up to Stinson Beach and there's nothing you can't do. <laughs> it's like crazy all the time. So you can, but you can, I mean, you can go to Burning Man and be completely nuts. Although now Burning Man's getting a bit corporate now. You're prob probably not, it's not very authentic. But, but yeah, it's easy to find spaces where you can legitimately do the stuff and it, it was always so even when they did the Eloisian mysteries and the Bacchanalian cults uh, in, in ancient Greece ancient Greece was extremely tolerant but they weren't tolerant of everything the Eloisian mysteries they still had to go out into the forest and do them all in secret and then they all whispers about what they were doing and stuff like that but yeah ever since civilization you've, you've had to do these altered states in secret so, so you, yeah but it's part of the fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd say speaking for myself, i um, been raised very in a sheltered like lifestyle. I've got a lot of protection. So, I mean, all my life I've been trying to breach that, you know, do things that are absurd or unusual. And then after this experience, it really poured it on, like, you got like something that so you got to do the absurd now you can't do it back and i said what, what are you saying and i said okay but it makes a lot of sense yeah 
Yeah, the, the temptation is to do a radical departure. And this, I, I haven't heard the term radical departure for many years, but psychologists used to write a lot of papers about radical departure. And what the syndrome that they were talking about happened a lot in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. It's basically radical departure was you'd get these kids, they would have a completely normal schooling, they would go to college, they'd be on a fast track to normal life and good, good career. And then in like first or second year in college, they'd get a bit too soaked in esoteric stuff or philosophy or religion or something, new age stuff. And they would completely blow their mind. They would give up their studies. They would do go off to Africa to live with a tribe and stuff. And then that became known as a radical departure. And there was a lot of science done on it. I think it doesn't happen so much anymore. They, at those times, people would go to India. They'd go to Goa and you know, stuff like that. Um, it doesn't happen so much anymore, I think, because they... The penalties for it are a lot, a lot higher. They and they medicate people. So if you do any of that, you you won't even start your journey to go. And they'll di diagnose you as bipolar, and they ha have you on some medicine that basically leaves you in a coma most of your day. So they they will subdue you. What they're actually doing is they're chemically castrating you. So if, if any one of those psychotropic drugs is a chemical castration. The idea is they cut off that shushumna and that shakti energy. So no, nobody on any psychotropic uh, drug, like thorazine or lithium or any, it, they, they, one of the symptoms is that they dampen your libido and sex drive. And that's the reason. That's the, that's the active part of them. <laughs> it's basically to make you into a eunuch. And to, yeah, to to dampen that sexual energy, which is the exact thing you don't want. Yeah, I'd say, yeah, um, for those who are experiencing this, um, it can be scary, especially if you don't know what you're going to getting yourself into. I mean, I, you, you talked about it before, but... I really thought that it wouldn't happen to a person living in a city. I, I really thought it would just, it has to be someone from India who practices this every day and they're so set on having it, but it can happen if, I think it can happen to, I believe now it can happen to people. They just practice, they just, even if they do it, if they do this practice and take it, you know, serious, some, you know, treat it with respect, just take it, uh, some form of seriousness can happen, yeah. <laughs> but, but it's yeah, something it's to celebrate. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's to celebrate, and uh, it's, it's something positive. So, so, yeah, and if anybody immediately who watches this video goes, yeah, that's it, that's it. <laughs> uh, if you get into trouble or anything, then, then just contact me, and I will, anybody can just contact me. I'm easy to contact me. Um, but and the only thing I ask is that people try try keep it public because there's no nothing really happens that's personal or private. Everybody everybody goes through the same shit. They just think it's personal. <laughs> it's ne never is. <laughs> so you you can help so many people by just having a video or something out there that. Um, you know, it's uh, you can save people's lives. You know, there's so many people that go off track, and we have a, a culture that drives people off track. So it can mean the world to to somebody to just you know have information like this out there. So yeah, so don't hesitate to contact me, anybody. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, contact you, and um, there's actually a lot of videos on YouTube alone, just people talking about the experience. And you wouldn't think it was possible until you experience it yourself. Because <laughs> I really thought it was just, ah, uh, these guys are quacks, but <laughs> now I'm thinking differently. Yeah. They, they are quacks, but like, you want to be a quack. <laughs> that's that's, well, that's, 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 that's better, yeah, that's accurate. <laughs> 
<laughs> so life is short, man, and um, you know it's like the ripeness is all this. You you want to do all the fairgrounds and all the rides at the fairgrounds. You want to get your money's worth, and so if you hold back and don't experience uh, as much as you can, if if you try and stay on the beaten path and run with the herd and be good. Um, you won't, you'll get the worst experience that's possible in this fairground. And that's a real tragedy from the point of view of the ripeness as well. You won't be dying ripe. You'll be dying not having experienced life. Yeah, exactly. Um, just, yeah. And one thing I'd say is um, this experience, I, I thought there was a baseline for how people experience life. You know, we just go through the motions and we get some insights but i think with an awakening it's another level that we didn't see before so and i'd say just uh, be open to to it if it comes yeah and when it comes yeah. and 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 that letting go is really important so so what sri ramakrishna said that he I don't know if this is legit, but anyway, the Gita is the Hindu's version of the Bible. It's not a great book because it's it's authoritarian and entrenches hierarchy and the caste system. So it's clearly an Aryan document, and it's like the Bible. It's made for subjugation. But Sri Ramakrishna said to understand the Gita, you just have to repeat it fast. So Gita, 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 and if in Tamil. Tagi is renunciation. So if you say Gita, 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 you get to Tagi. <laughs> so he said Gita is really Tagi. Uh, and, and he said that's all, all the Gita is really about. I think it's not a bad way to look at it, and it's certainly a, a good lesson, and this is all about letting go. And letting go of attachments, um, letting go of fear, letting go of everything, and you just say like, uh, uh, a lot of the thing is they'd say like, you know, people with a religious aspect would say, "Thy will be done, not my will." So it's this idea of let 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 the the universe's plan unfold. We we kind of it's kind of like you know the the universe is trying to lay on a a show or or put on a meal or make love to us, and we, we're fucking it up. <laughs> we, we continually stick our oar in and mess it up. Uh, if we just lay back and let things roll, we would get the, the best experience that, that the universe is trying to lay on for. And it, it's the, that lesson goes all the way through to climate change and geoengineering and activism and rebellion is, it, you know, you you have you can't be a a dummy and just lie there. <laughs> but you 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 have to play the part. But the idea is that it's a game and you you play it. You you it's like improv theater, and you you know you don't try and do what Roger Hallam's doing is like force the universe to be this way or force transhumanism or force this force that control everything is like saying like no you're ruining the show, just. Just really let it unfold and play your part as as if you you're a good improv performer and you're doing your part of a of a dual improv performance where Carly does hers, Leela, the universe does her thing, and you respond and you know you entertain her and she entertains you, and that's really a healthy mindset. But unfortunately, we we don't have a healthy mindset. We're all pretty much fucking insane. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, letting go, that's something that even before my experience, I've always been drawn to that, just letting go, because recently I've just been, I figured out there's things that were hard for me to let go, um, like relationships with family, um, uh, some material things, and I think especially in civilized civilization, we, or in cities, we, we like to hoard things, or people hoard. And 
I said, oh my gosh, that's, yeah, I mean, that's, we're not letting go if we hoard things. And, yeah, oh, everything. And we, we're so acquisitive. <laughs> Our mindset is so acquisitive that we try and, um, you know, acquire experiences and something. I, and I'm just, I'm, I'm here in paradise here. And, and I'm, you know, I feel sorry for these guys because they come in on boats and they, they come in from like, particularly somewhere like Germany or something. And they have like a week's holiday on a boat. So they have a week's holiday in paradise. And you can see that they're not really enjoying it because they, they come in and they immediately go, oh, this is paradise. Out comes the phone, they're clicking everywhere. And, then, and it turns to shit because while they're clicking everywhere, then, you know, the guy on the helm's telling them to like, you know, oh, concentrate on the anchor. We need to anchor now. And it's, oh, I just need this pin. And then it gets fucked up and the next boat's shouting at them and it becomes hell. So the mere fact that they want, want to capture this, they're like, I've got a week in paradise. Now I need to grasp it, hold it. I need to put it on the internet. I need to get, you know, get value out of it. And it fucks it up. So then pretty soon they're arguing with people. Uh, people are shouting. It's, it's turning into disharmony. And it's it's that acquisitiveness that it just runs so deep. They're gonna, you know, they're gonna go back and they're gonna try and do that in their job. They're gonna try and acquire a, a bigger position, acquire more money, acquire more stuff, acquire status. On and on and on. Just never give up. Never let let the damn thing go. <laughs> right. I mean, there's so many examples you gave, uh, like the 49ers who kept their gold in their pockets and they drowned with their gold. And that's what's going to, yeah. I mean, if we yeah. keep on hoarding, that's what's going to happen. We're going to drown with all our stuff, our stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great book called Ship of Gold in a Deep Blue Sea. And that was about those, the 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 sinking of the, uh, not the Birkenhead. I can't remember what the, uh, the uh, just slips my mind what the boat was. But um, yeah, it, it sank with all these passengers that came uh, from California, 49ers, successful 49ers, and they're all coming back to the East Coast with all their gold in their pockets, and most of them went to the bottom because they, they didn't want to <laughs> empty the gold out of their pockets. <laughs> so they found them on the bottom with the fucking gold in their yeah. pockets. It's, it's, it's terrible. <laughs> I like that's how you see. where we are, Green New Deal. That's the Green New Deal. <laughs> It, it, that ship might, might have been called the SS Green New Deal. Right. And um, you said if, if they just thought a little differently, like it's an adventure, easy come, easy go, you know, we lose our gold, it's fine. <laughs> it's part of the adventure. So I said, yeah, that's, that's a good way to think about it. Yeah. But, but you see, they, they try to hold on and, and they, they're trying to freeze frame, right? So they've got this gold, and now they must always have this gold. They, they can never reappraise it saying, well, I thought I had gold and I was made for life, but what it turned out to be was just a fucking good story to use in a bar later. And they can't go from, I'm set for life, for, ah, it was just a good story in the bar. So that, that's the attachment, is, is they, they have to fix it. They have to seize it in, in place. So we... Our alien cortex is making us uh, slip out of time. So, you know, we, we go too far ahead, we go too far into the past, we try and capture the moment, you know, the current present moment, we try and fix it so that it's always like that. And we can't just let the, letting go means, you know, letting the parade pass. And don't try and stop any of the, <laughs> the stop the parade or try and like grab anything out of the parade. Oh, it wrecks the parade, you know. Oh, well, so easy to be wise, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, easy to be wise. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, this, I think this was good, and I hope any people who, who listen to this will get something out of it. And he, he mentioned that um, he's willing to, you willing, are you willing to talk to others, too? To yeah, yeah, I would, I would love to, if anybody wants, yeah. yeah. All right, well, then let's, I'll stop the recording there and then. Yeah. The but thanks for sharing that, Mike. That's yeah, really no problem. That's really brave of you um, to do that. Yeah, but, I was nervous, but, you know, why not? 
it's just, you know, I, I feel like if people shared their experience, it's okay to, to share mine yeah. as well. Yeah, it's, it's, hopefully it's kind of like a relief and unburdening. Yeah. All right, I'm um, stop recording. Oh, yeah.